interested in this subject, the role of fungi in the, is it fungi or fungi? <laughs> Whatever. Uh, in the Palestinian ecosystem. Anyway, uh, Dr. Teresa Kaddish, uh, who wrote the first paper on fungi on Palestine uh, a few years ago when uh, she was here, uh, uh, con continued to work and ended up uh, doing a PhD in uh, fungi. And she will talk to you about it uh, now. And Sarah will record this and so we can share it with those who are not here. Uh, so go ahead. We can make it full screen also. Uh, it is full screen. So no. oh, okay. Yeah, I'm in presenting. Oh, okay. Yes, we're, we're all set. Hi, hello, good morning. Um, so I'm going to be speaking exclusively in English because I don't speak any Arabic. I apologize for that. I wish I could present to you in a different language, but so it is. Um, so today we're going to talk about the role of fungi in Palestinian ecosystems. Um, so we'll start just with a very broad uh, point of what, what are fungi, right? So this is a little bit of a phylogenetic tree just to give you some sense of moment. Should I? Yeah. Um, to give you some sense of the, the scope of the fungal kingdom and its relationship to uh, creatures, that you might be more familiar with. Let me let this person in. Hello, hello. Okay, so today we're gonna to be talking about fungi, right? So fungi come in a number of major clades and you can see their relationship to the outgroup here represented by this ant, Animalia. Uh, so you've got the chytrids, the zygomycota, glomermycota, ascomycota, and basidiomycota. I'm not gonna to spend too much time describing the differences between these phyla, but just, get some sense that fungi have very large groups in the same way that there's, you know, invertebrate animals and there's mollusks and there's vertebrates and you have some probably intuition for like the different major groups of the animal kingdom. So there are similar major groups in the fungal kingdom. So fungi are multicellular and they are more closely related to animals than plants, which is a common misconception, right? Because you see them growing in association with plants and they don't move like animals. So people often think that they are a kind of plant, but they're not. In fact, they're, they're heterotrophic, right? All, all fungi eat other things. And so they are more closely related to animals than, than plants. And this, this cladogram depicts that. So what are we going to be talking about in regards to fungi? Let me pull up the next slide. So when I was here uh, in the past, in 2019, we wrote a paper where we, we did a, a biodiversity survey, right? So this is, this is the abstract for it. And I'm gonna basically summarize um, the, the most visual results of this paper. But we visited field sites throughout the West Bank and photographed and gathered a number of fungal specimens. And they're now stored uh, in the museum archives here for further research. So these are the sites that we gathered fungi from. Uh, most of them are, um, although we did admit, uh, sorry, not I'm going to admit this person. We did gather from as far south as Hebron. Um, so these are the six sites that we gathered samples from. And here we can see some, some landscape shots of them, right? So generally speaking, you're gonna find fungi in forested areas, meadows, uh, bushes, trees, that sort of thing, because they are almost always in association with plants. And so while we're gonna be talking about fungi today, what we're actually gonna be talking about is ecosystem relationships and the way that fungi interact with other plants and animals in their environment in order to, to create a cohesive network of nutrient exchange and um, metabolism, right? So let's just sort of jump right into the visuals before I get into any details of, of the, the functions of these mushrooms in the ecosystem. I just sort of want to show you. Everybody's coming in. Hello, hello. Okay, so yeah. Oh, okay. So I don't have to hit the button every time? Great. So, um, what the next several slides, I'm going to show you a, a selection of the samples that we found. I, I think they're quite beautiful, right? And that's, that's sort of like one of the more stunning things about these creatures is just that they're, they're so striking and unusual looking. And so at the top of each slide, I have the Latin name as well as a word describing their ecological 
relationship with the environment. And I'll define those words later on. But right now, I just want to take a minute or so to appreciate these images and the diversity of, of colors and shapes uh, that the fruiting bodies of these fungi have. So this is an ascomycot, ascomycota. Here's another ascomycota. Um, this is a parasite growing on it. Um, this was growing on the museum grounds on an olive tree. This is also growing on olive, right? So they take a lot of shapes and forms, um, and and they're they're really quite striking. So we're going to go over the the morphology of of these creatures and and how they function and what they do. Just wanted to give you some visual sense. All right. So what is a mushroom? Right. So, so the first thing to keep in mind and, and to remind yourself of whenever you see one of these things in the wild is that what you are seeing above the ground, here we have this, the, the, the classic mushroom shape, the agaric shape, what you're seeing above the ground is actually just the reproductive structure of the fungus. So the majority of the organism spends its life underground in some kind of substrate, whether it's going to be wood or soil or sometimes um, some other sort of parasitic host. But the the mushroom, when it when it comes up for open air, that's really just witnessing the, the sexual reproductive stage of the life cycle. So the vast majority of the time that the fungus is alive, it's growing in this distributed hyphal network. So you can see in this image, there's hyphae labeled here in both the, the mushroom and the mycelial network below. So mycelium, the word mycelium in English, is defined as a network of single-celled hyphal strands. And that network will secrete digestive enzymes and have a lot of enzymatic activity and basically absorb nutrients from its environment. So you can think of a hyphal network as basically a giant stomach, right? Where in animals, the stomach is a sac and, and the only food that can be digested is inside the stomach. But in a fungus, it's inverted, right? Like the fungus is growing mycelium into the environment and it's secreting enzymes outside of it and then taking nutrients in. So when we're looking at these mushrooms, we're really looking at the reproductive structure. So akin to flowers in plants, in the same way that picking the flowers off of a tree is not going to damage the tree from year to year, picking mushrooms from the ground is not going to damage the hyphal network underneath. So we're going to explore now some of the ecological roles that these fungi play. Um, so here we can see an image of a fungus and a plant in partnership. So the mycelial network is below the soil and you can see that it is interacting with the roots of this pine sapling. So the, the roots of the pine sapling are actually quite limited in scope. It's just a single line in sort of a darker tan. And then all of the white, so the vast majority of the fibers that you see in this image um, are mycelial strands. So this is an ectomycorrhizal fungus. So it's wrapping itself quite intimately around the roots of the pine and allowing nutrient exchange. So particularly when the pine seedling is very small, as you see in this picture, having access to a large mycelial network for exchange of nutrients is really critical for these early plants to develop and grow and, and you know, maintain the forest that they produce. So uh, this slide here talks about some of the uh, major ecological roles that fungi play. So there are keywords on this slide that we're going to be returning to throughout the rest of the presentation. Um, so we're going to look at uh, going from left to right here. You can see the first one. I, I don't know if you can see my mouse or not. Hopefully you can. But on the left, you see parasitic fungi. So there is a, a fruiting body here growing out of the stem of this plant, right? So some fungus grows inside living tissue, whether it's plant tissue or animal tissue. Uh, cordyceps is a very famous animal parasite. Uh, you might have met someone that has like fungus growing underneath their toes. It's a little gross, but there are fungal parasites that infect living organisms, although they're actually in the minority because most living organisms will fight the fungi and, and, and you get a very sort of fierce arms race between the fungus and the, and the living host. Uh, and it makes it more limited in terms of scope of evolution. Um, the vast majority of fungal species that you will encounter in the world are not parasites, but rather either symbionts or decomposers. So the next uh, ecological role that you see in the slide is mycorrhizal. So mycorrhizal fungus, fungus, that's what we saw in this slide here, is a fungal network, fungal network that will 
partner with the roots of a plant. So it will either wrap the hyphae around the roots very tightly, or in some cases actually enter into the cells of the roots for a very intimate kind of nutrient exchange. Right, so you might have also heard of lichens, like lichens are, are a version of this with, with bacteria, but basically fungi specialize in secreting digestive enzymes that are capable of breaking down very difficult things to break down, specifically rocks, right? Plants can't break down rocks. They can't get nutrients directly out of hard rock. So you need a different kind of organism, one that specializes in producing enzymes, in order to get minerals out of bare, bare substrate. So fungi will partner with plants where the fungi will secrete these enzymes that can break down rocks or, or other difficult to break down things. And then they will exchange those nutrients with the plant in exchange for sugars, right? So plants can photosynthesize, they can get energy out of the sun, fungi can't do that. So you have this symbiotic relationship where the fungi do what they are specialized to do, the plants do what they're specialized to do, and you mutually grow. And one of the other interesting things that this enables is that the many uh, mycorrhizal fungal species can connect to multiple plant hosts. So you see in this image, right, there's this green plant and there's this brown plant and there's these pink and purple mycelial networks that are connecting the two. So in, in the ground, in, in a wild ecosystem, you will find that most of the plants in that ecosystem are tangentially connected to one, one another through these mycelial networks. So the mushrooms provide not just nutrient exchange, but also information exchange that can allow plants uh, of the same species in different areas, and in some cases of different species throughout a particular environment to, to connect and exchange information. So that's a very, very critical ecological role. And we'll look uh, in a moment at some of the fungi in Palestine that, that play this role. And the last thing, the last ecological role here on the right is uh, mushrooms on death. And this term is called saprophytic. Um, so saprophytic fungi don't grow on living tissue like parasites or mycorrhizal fungi do. Instead, they grow on dead tissue. So wood being the primary example. Um, wood is is basically plastic, right? It's a hard plastic polymer, and it doesn't break down very easily. That's why we build houses out of it. So saprophytic fungi can secrete enzymes to break down the wood and turn it into more useful nutrients that can then cycle through the ecosystem. So there are two main kinds of saprophytic fungi. There's primary saprophobes that will digest undigested wood, think like whole trees. And then there's secondary saprophobes that will break down soil matter into simpler components. And we're gonna look at both of those. Um, so just to summarize this slide, because I'm gonna be using these words throughout the rest of the presentation, right? So there's sort of uh, three main groups of fungi that we're gonna be looking at. There's parasites, there's mycorrhizal symbionts, and there's decomposers, saprophobes, right? And there are subdivisions of all of these, right? Different kinds of parasites, different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi, different kinds of saprophobes. But that's generally the, the categories that we find them in. So they're either living on a living thing, they're partnering mutualistically with a living thing, or they're consuming a dead thing. So um, any questions about that before we get into some examples? No? We're good? Okay. So let's go back to these pictures. So uh, this mushroom here is Zero, and I, I often can't pronounce the Latin, Zero Camellus regulehi um, is ectomycorrhizal. So ectomycorrhizae specific, ecto means outside, so like sheath. So the mycelium of this particular fungus, and you can see a little bit of it at the base of this image on the left, right? Those little white fibers. Um, so ectomycorrhizae sort of grow through the forest floor and they partner with roots. And this particular species partners with conifers, with pines, and the mycelium will wrap around the roots and basically extend the surface area of that root matter tremendously by an order of magnitude, right? So the mycelial network can penetrate through the soil much more effectively than tree roots can because it's a lot thinner. And so a lot of the nutrient uptake for the tree is actually done by the fungus, which then transfers those nutrients to the tree. Um, this mushroom is, is called a bolete. You can see that the it's a polypore, right? So the, the undersurface here is 
spongy. It's yellow and spongy. So this is the, the sexual surface of the mushroom. So this is where meiosis occurs. So you've got nuclei fusing and crossing over happening of the genes and, and then spore production. So these mushrooms are spore producing organs that allow the fungus to reproduce for the next generation. Great. So this is Geopora arenosa. It is also mycorrhizal, uh, but this species, rather than partnering with pines like this one, this species partners with mosses, and you can see the mosses growing all around it, right? So mosses are very primitive plants, right? They're extremely basal on the plant family tree, and mosses are hypothesized to be the first plants to move from the oceans onto land. And when they made that evolutionary change 350 million years ago, they hadn't really developed roots. And so it's widely believed that the way that plants were able to originally evolve into land habitats was in partnership with mycorrhizal fungi. That before plants evolved really robust roots that we see in trees, the nutrient absorption capacities that they needed was basically outsourced to another kind of creature. So this is a very, very old partnership, about 350 million years old. And uh, it allows, it's sort of the foundation that all of the rest of the ecosystem relies on, all the animal life and all the plant life relies on these partnerships. So Geopora arenosa, this is uh, a cup fungus, right? So if we go back to the very beginning here, when I said there are multiple phyla of fungi, right? So there are, we're, what we're going to be looking at are these two phyla here. There's Basidiomycota and Ascomycota. If we have time at the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about Glomeromycota because they're very interesting. But most of the samples that you'll be able to find using the naked eye if you're ever out in the forest and you want to find some of these creatures are going to be either Basidiomycota or Ascomycota. And they're very similar um, evolutionarily, but they produce spores in slightly different ways. Basidiomycota make that classic like mushroom shape, whereas Ascomycota are pockmarked. Um, so if we look at this, this is a clear Basidiomycota shape, right? It's got a stem and a spore producing surface in, in that classic mushroom shape. Whereas this cup fungus is, is typical of, of a member of Ascomycota, right? So the spore producing surface is on the inside instead of at the bottom. Um, so there's quite a lot of morphological diversity here. Um, and again, this species, Geopora arenosa, is mycorrhizal, so it's partnering with the moss that is all around it. So one of the key things for identifying a fungus is by noticing what plants it's associated with, because these are very ecologically integrated creatures, and you can't really usually identify a mushroom just by the shape of the mushroom. You almost always have to pay attention to the other organisms that it is in relationship with. And I think that's one of the most important lessons that these creatures teach us is just how much we are interconnected and codependent on, on all of the other life around us. Um, you really cannot describe or characterize mushrooms without describing the other creatures that they're in partnership with. So this mushroom here, Helvola lacrinosa, it has um, a common name, at least in English, of elven saddle. And you can see on the left, uh, the, the, the mushroom cap is, is sort of saddle shaped. It's got that sort of hyperbolic shaped. So this is another ascomycot. You can tell that it's ascomycota because the, the spore producing surface is laminar. It's just like a, a single sort of skin texture as opposed to gills or pores. And you can see these pockmarked stem. So Helva lacunosa is also ectomycorrhizal. I'm showing you the, the mycorrhizal fungi first. So this species partners with oaks um, and also pines. Um, and it was found in, in sort of shrubland um, in the Bethlehem region. Um, so the ecological relationships that uh, these mushrooms can, can show us are, are actually quite layered. So this next species here, Hypomyces cerevinius, is a parasite. And it is a very specific parasite. The only thing that it parasitizes is Helvola species, right? So this is the fruiting body of Helvola lacunosa, uh, and it's, it's an ascomycote. And this pink fuzz is another member of ascomycota. It's in, in the genus Hypomyces. So Hypomyces are specifically fruiting body parasites, and they do this really incredible thing. So they will colonize the, the mushroom cap, the fruiting body of another species of mushroom, and they will transform that tissue into spore producing structures for themselves. So Hypomyces, like other kinds of fungus, produces a mycelial network underground, and you know it, it does its, its 
um, heterotrophic eating thing. But when it comes time to reproduce, it will parasitize another fruiting body and sort of take that morphology and turn it into its own spore production. So this is sort of like a classic parasitic move, kind of like a virus, like taking over a cell and using the cell to reproduce its own structures. This is very similar, but in the fungal kingdom. Right. So we have all of these different ecological relationships on top of each other. The hypomyces is parasitizing the halvola. The halvola is partnering with the plants around it. And all these things are, are located on top of each other. So all these different living worlds literally in the same place. So um, next we're going to look at uh, another parasite, although this this species here, Omphalotus olaria, sort of operates on the boundary between parasite and saprotroph. So Omphalotus um, is a jack-o'-lantern mushroom. So if you find these very fresh, they'll actually glow in the dark, which is really cool. This mushroom is quite toxic. It's often confused with oyster mushrooms, which is a common edible mushroom, but the, the color is quite different. The host is quite different. Um, this was found on the museum grounds, um, on, the, on the olive tree, right outside the front door to the museum. Um, and you'll notice that it's specifically, it's growing on a portion of the olive wood that is basically dead, right? Like olives have these very long lived life cycles and parts of the trees will remain metabolically active while other parts will not. So there are large categories of, of weakly parasitic fungi that they'll live on living things, but they'll mostly live on the living things that aren't putting up much of a fight, right? So they'll find the portion of trees that are not very metabolically active and, and they will start digesting them. And then if the tree dies, they might colonize the entire tree, but for the most part, they, they remain like a low level pest. So this is Omphalotus illyrius. And so depending on its circumstances, it will either be weakly parasitic or saprotrophic, meaning eating dead wood. So now we're going to move into talking about uh, saprotrophs, a sampling of saprotrophs that live around here. Um, so this is another olive uh, host, olive olive eating creature. Um, this is Cryptomerasmus cobariensis. This mushroom is extremely small. And you can see here that it is growing on olive leaves. Um, so the life cycle of this fungus is very short lived. It will uh, grow and sort of eat as much nutrition as it can off of a single olive leaf, and that doesn't take very long. And then when it rains, it will fruit and send off spores, and those spores won't travel very far. You know, and maybe they'll go just a few feet and they'll land on a new olive leaf and repeat the cycle over and over and over again many, many times in a season. So this mushroom is about, I don't know, five centimeters tall, and the cap is less than a centimeter wide. It's quite beautiful. It's got this like wiry stipe. Um, and so that's, this is how tr leaves decompose, right? When leaves fall down off of trees and, and sort of they turn brown. Like we don't really think about how these things turn into soil, but they, they would not turn into soil if there were not fungi that were testing them. Um, and an interesting comment on this is that uh, trees developed all of these like basically hard plastics, lignin and cellulose, that gives them the structure that they have and for a long time, many millions of years after the development of these polymers, cellulose and lignin, there were no living creatures that could digest them. The fungi had not actually evolved the chemical pathways required to make enzymes that can digest lignin and cellulose. Um, so there was a period of time, about 300 million years ago, where trees had evolved and they were growing and they were making lots and lots of wood and difficult to digest things. And there were no decomposers for them. And so they just fell and created these big bogs of, of uh, not quite decomposing wood, wood that was not able to decompose. And these are all of the coal deposits that exist in the world today. Okay, were laid down in this period of time between the evolution of woody plants and the evolution of fungi. And once fungi evolved, they were able to capture the majority of the carbon that dies from these trees and you know keep them active in the ecosystem. So basically what we're doing when we're burning fossil fuels is, um, acting as as very long-term decomposer, sort of breaking down this energy that was stored 300 million years ago prior to the advent of fungi that could do it more efficiently. Um, so that is why fossil fuels are a finite resource because mushrooms evolved to take care of it long, long ago. Um, so let's continue uh, looking at, at these photographs. So this is Lentinus arcularius. Um, so this is a polypore. You can see that it has these, these interesting spongy structure. And it is saprotrophic. So this this particular sample is a very likely candidate for being a species that is unique to Palestine. 
Um, when I was doing research around this species, I found a number of descriptions and photographs, uh, most of them from Europe, European samples. Uh, and the European samples of this species, if you look up this species name online and find images, you'll see that they're, they look slightly different. There's like a hairy fringe around, around the cap and um, the coloration is, is slightly off. And of course, these creatures have a tremendous amount of morphological diversity and uh, species concepts in, in fungi are, are not as well defined as they are in animals because the ways that uh, fungi have sex are a lot more diverse. But we have this sample in the museum and potentially at some future point, it could be genetically analyzed um, and, and that evidence could be used to determine whether this is a species that is unique to Palestine or, or whether it's just some sort of sub variant of, of the more commonly photographed European species. So that was a lot of, of what we did in this research was, was sort of documenting the particular fruiting bodies that exist in this region and comparing them to fruiting bodies that, that have been documented elsewhere in the world uh, to better understand the range of these species and also determine uh, what, what was unique about this particular region. So next we have Volvopluteus gliocephalus. So this is a secondary saprophobe. So you'll notice that this species, unlike the, you know, if I go back to here, like this is growing on wood, this is growing on something that's clearly identifiable as a leaf, right? That makes them primary saprotrophs, right? They're growing on undigested plant litter. Whereas this is secondary. So this is a, a compost mushroom, basically. So it's similar to the mushrooms that you can buy at the grocery store. It digests um, orally or already broken down plant matter, stuff that has been consumed by worms, for example, or, or leaves that are already in a high level of decay. So this mushroom grows in, in fields and it comes up when it rains. It has an interesting anatomical structure here. You can see on the right, it's called a vulva. So the entire thing sort of emerges out of this egg-shaped cap and that is characteristic of this genus Volvopluteus, as well as another genus, Amanita. Uh, so here is another ascomycete, ascomycete. So you can see the morphological resemblance to the photo that I showed earlier, this Geopora arenosa, right? It's, it's a cup fungus, right? So that cup shape uh, quickly identifies it as, as ascomycota as opposed to basidiomycota. And this is a secondary saprophobe. So again, it's growing in soil. It's breaking down already decomposed matter. This region has a very high diversity of Pazisa, right? This particular group of cup fungus, Pazisa, Pazisiales. Um, there's there's a number of, of papers uh, published about this, that this region, I don't exactly know why, something to do with the confluence of the three continents um, and the moisture levels allows for, for greater diversity of Pazisiales than, than I have seen in, in other parts of the world. So these are very small, very interesting looking fungi. Um, so this last fungus is edible. It's the only edible fungus that I have on this list. It's Coprinus comatus. Comatus is like the, the Latin word for eating food. Um, also known as inky cap. And there's a, this, this mushroom has a very interesting um, decay cycle. So it, it grows on, on pine, decaying pine duff and hay and things like that. Um, and it's very short lived. So you can see all of these different maturity stages of the mushroom. And when it's small, it's white and has these little sort of hairy frills around it. And just in the course of a day or two, it will start to auto digest itself. So what happens is it secretes enzymes that break down the material in the mushroom and send them back into the mycelial network so that it can continue to grow. And as a part of that enzymatic digestion process, the cap sort of dissolves into this black ink. And it's very black, um, you could use it for artistic purposes, I suppose, if you wanted. Um, so finding this mushroom, it's very temperamental. Like it is edible and it's actually a very tasty mushroom, but you can only eat it if you find it within, I don't know, six to 12 hours of it fruiting, because within a day it will have digested itself. And you can see in these images, all the various stages of, of decay of Coprinus comatus. So um, that is a sampling of the species that uh, we found in photographed. Um, as I said at the top, uh, we identified 27 macrofungi species in, in about a maybe five week period that we were sampling. There are certainly far more species than that. Um, and of those 27, I've shown you pictures of, of I don't know, 10 or 12. Uh, and again, they're just they're really striking and beautiful. Like if you take anything away from this talk, it's just uh, please let it be that, that nature is really diverse and there's all these really remarkable creatures growing underneath your feet. Um, so I don't know how much time we have um, for like the, the general scope of this talk. So I can good. go on. All right. 
So I've prepared a little bit more information. Um, so if we go back to the, the top of this presentation, right? So here is a, a broad phylogenetic tree of fungi, right? So what we have been talking about for, for this morning has been exclusively Basidiomycota and Ascomycota, right? Because these are the mushroom producing fungi. Um, these are the things that you will see with the naked eyes you're walking around. But there's another very important and critical fungal phyla called Glomeromycota that don't produce, uh, they're not macro fungi, right? They don't produce visible fruiting bodies, but they are always present in the soil and in fact are directly responsible for, for a lot of soil composition and soil fertility. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about glomeromycota because they're definitely here, even though we have not um, specifically identified them. They're, they're, they're most easily identifiable by sort of taking soil samples and, and doing DNA analysis, right? So a lot of a lot of the species distinctions for glomeromycota are very poorly understood because the way that they have sex is strange and also just isolating a particular sample is challenging. Um, but their ecological role is is very well defined. So um, there are two kinds of mycorrhizal relationships, right? So we were talking about ectomycorrhizal first. Uh, so some of the macrofungi that I showed you are ectomycorrhizal, right? So this, this zero camellus is ectomycorrhizal, meaning that the way that it partners with pines is that it um, secretes, or it, it creates these sort of like mycelial sheaths that wrap around the roots and like a like a, a sock and a foot kind of relationship or a hand and a glove kind of relationship. And they wrap around the roots and exchange nutrients. So you can see here on the left, this is this is a diagram of ectomycorrhizae and the, the hyphal networks are, are surrounding the roots. And they actually do go into the root a little bit, um, but they stay outside of the cell wall. Whereas Endomycorrhizae are the relationship is much much more intimate. Right, so this is a, a member of Glomeromycota, and it will send its hyphae into plant roots and then actually penetrate the cells of the plant, so that that basically the cytoplasm is touching. So the cytoplasm of the Glomeromycota and the cytoplasm of the plant are touching. Right, so this is um, this kind of relationship took millions of years to evolve, and it's very very delicate. Right, like it takes a tremendous amount of communication because this could very quickly turn into parasitism, right? Like you, you, if you allow another creature like literally inside of your cells, like it's it's a very risky kind of situation. Um, so glomeromycota had to evolve um, a lot of communication mechanisms basically to allow them to cooperate with plants in, in such an intimate fashion, right? So this is a, a, a large picture of what's called an arboscope. So you can see here what is in, in sort of darker teal or, or gray is the glomeromycotin tissue. And what is lighter in sort of a sort of a, a light, light um, aqua color is, is the plant tissue. So this process is called invagination, right? And rather graphically. And basically what happens is you get a double membrane effect where the glomeromycota will sort of grow this tree-shaped structure into the, the cell of its host, which basically creates an, a, a tremendous amount of surface area for membrane to membrane contact, right? So there will be ion channels in between the plant cell and the glomeromycotin cell that allow for nutrients and, and information bearing molecules to be exchanged from, from one partner to another, right? So these are sort of little little gifts that that give you a sense of, of what this is like so this is the way that that fungi grow like what you see on the on the outer surface of it is just the fruiting body but underneath you have these sort of cell connections that are constantly being formed and broken and that is that is how they live their lives so here's here's another image of that right so these are um hyphal hyphal cell networks growing so um the the thing about glomeromycota is that it is like these group of fungi are largely responsible for storing and sequestering soil carbon, right? If glomeromycota did not exist, um, the ability of our soils to act as a carbon sink to hold water and nutrients would be extremely uh, limited, right? So there was a, a USDA study that reported that glomalin, which is this main compound that glomeromycota produce, is responsible for about a third of all of the carbon that is uh, stored in the soil. So you can see here, this is a, a sort of typical image of, of a relationship of glomeromycota to a plant host. So 
Uh, you can see the, the roots here of the plant are, are in neon green. And then all of this darker fibrous tissue around them are endomycorrhizal fungi, glomeromycota. And the circles here are their spore producing structures. So this is their, their method of reproducing, um, which is quite unique, although I don't think I will have time to go into that. Um, but so these glomeromycota, they, they basically create a kind of glue. Um, so glomalin is, is this, um, like it's, it's a, a, a macro protein. It's a very heavy protein that's extremely durable and it binds soil particles together. So what this enables is it allows the soil to hold onto much, much more water than it would be able to do otherwise. So here's um, a, a, a visual representation of this. So scientists took uh, a soil sample and you can see it has this sort of like brownish color. Um, and they had to do this extremely strenuous process to isolate the glomalin from the soil. What did they do? They heated it at 250 degrees for an hour uh, and then dissolved it in some acid, right? And so you can see that the majority of the dark soil color actually comes from the glomalin, right? So you've got the soil after the extraction. The glomalin is this like almost red color and the soil after the extraction of the glomalin is like kind of gray. So when you are a farmer and you're trying to identify like what's good soil, what is soil that's going to have good qualities, you typically want to find really dark soils. And that dark coloration comes from glomalin, right? Like the glomalin present in these soils gives the soils the kind of qualities that plants like, right? Meaning that they're, they're sort of like fluffy and they hold a lot of nutrients. Um, they hold on to water really well. So... Um, Glomalin is is very recently understood. It was discovered in the mid '90s, uh, and it's come to to represent sort of like this like really key ecosystem service that that fungi offer, and particularly glomeromycota. Um, all soil fungi are are directly responsible for creating the chemical composition and physical composition of of the soils that all of the plants that grow around us live in. Um, so these creatures are are extremely essential. Um, for supporting all of ecosystems. And they, they largely go unnoticed because all we see are their sexual structures, but they're, they're at the foundation of, of food chains and, and not, just, not just like these sort of like nutrient exchange things, but like the very substrate that everything else is living in is, is produced by them. Um, so that's all I have for you today. I hope you can appreciate fungi a little bit more and uh, can take some questions if there are any. Okay, thank you, Teresa. Anybody has questions or comments about this? Go ahead, uh, Dr. Walid. Uh, should, do I have to unmute him? Uh, no, he... Uh, okay, thank you for the uh, really great presentation. And uh, I learned a lot of uh, things about the mechanism of uh, fungi in uh, the area. And uh, I think because I'm doing a little uh, mushroom hunting and photographing in the northern part of Palestine, I think if you just uh, expand the sampling in the northern part, I think there is a lot, many of the other species here around. Maybe I will send uh, Mazen uh, some of the photos uh, of the other species around here. In yeah, there are many. Species. I noticed. I noticed while you are talking that um, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, there is one the obvious. I think the 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 one the only edible you mentioned the the, the edible. edible. Uh, but yeah, for the Volvo Plotius, it is the most common edible mushroom in in Palestine. You uh, know? Yeah, <laughs> the, the people you know collected in in a large amount. It's not that delicious, but uh, mainly the one in the market and the one is collected in the field. The most of the people seeking for is the uh, Volvo plots. <laughs> uh, that's true. Yeah. So uh, my standards of edibility uh, are perhaps different than than some other people's. Right. Like I, I maybe I'm a little bit of a snob. Like the, I, there's only a few mushrooms that I particularly like to eat. So like this one, like I know is very good. Um, there are many mushrooms that, yeah, you can eat them. They can be difficult to find in quantities uh, that you like or or like the texture or flavor is is not so great. But yes, there are edible species of ovoplutius. So uh, yeah, I, I misspoke but, uh, a little bit. I have a yeah, but... on this, Walid. Uh, the, uh, 
Dr. Warid, uh, how can, uh, maybe the question is for both of you, is how can we collaborate to get these mushrooms? Is there a way to, like, can you freeze these mushrooms or can you, if you take photographs, maybe Teresa can tell us, uh, can tell you. Uh, you know. uh, uh, we can do we can do it in both ways. Of uh, we have photographs and we can make a freeze a freeze sample. Plus, the we can make spore print. Mm -hmm. And you can dry spore them print in silver in silver. You know, in silver uh, law in paper. And we can just if, uh, put it in the refrigerator. The spore print. Mm -hmm. So it's it's it's, 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 a, it's a very good time to do this after all yeah. these things. Uh, you wanna? Should we like put some sort of a scale when we photograph them in the field or something? Yeah, it 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 is that easy because usually I catch by uh, I take the sample, then I took some sample with my hand, although so it's easy all all the time to to take the scale of the of the samples, and I just you know just an hour I back just from uh, mushroom hunting from the mountains, <laughs> so I I was just collecting some of the mushrooms. Around. Yeah, I, I think I, like in in the northern bar, maybe uh, more than one hundred species until now. Um, yeah, it's really why because we have the oak, the the largest. I don't know, imagine you know the cerise, the the largest oak uh, forest in Palestine in in the northern bar. Uh, yeah. So, al mixer, Doctor Mazen. It's so, really yeah. huge. You can come your way and you can work with Teresa and publish a paper. Uh, it's it's a pleasure. It's a ple it's a pleasure, yeah. really a pleasure with that. And you know that uh, it is great always to work with the museum. It's uh, you are the center for this uh, research, is amazing. And thank you for the really nice presentation. And really, we we a lot of information we got. Thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah, I imagine the diversity where you are is probably higher than here in Bethlehem. So I, I would love to, to see what's growing there. Maybe we'll yeah. come your way in a couple of weeks yeah. or uh, so. Um, Most of the week. There's another hand raised. Do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask a question? Thank you very much, Professor Mazen, and thank you very much, Dr. Teresa and Dr. Walid, about, uh, about speaking a lot about the mushroom. Yeah, it's an, as interesting, an interesting uh, presentation. Yeah, I started my uh, my small project of mushroom since 2015 when I was in China visiting a big enterprise for growing oyster mushroom and different type of mushroom. Mm -hmm. As a as a professor, what he mentioned there is a many there is a many other type of mushroom. Maybe you are you not mentioning your study because I collected about fifteen to seventeen sample of mushroom. Some of them the same of the species you mentioned here, and other type is different. Yeah, it, in in the north part of West Bank, especially in Nablus area. Yeah, I collected the many type. Uh, uh, I can uh, answer a question of uh, a question of Professor Mazin about uh, how we can preserve the the mushroom because I try to doing a dry mushroom and mm -hmm. uh, dry mushroom from yester mushroom and agaricus mushroom. Mm -hmm. We can doing a dry also from a dry mushroom. I I doing a small a small test. From a dry mushroom, you can produce uh, a, a new spore or spawn from a dry mushroom. I, I doing a dry oyster mushroom for three years and doing like tissue culture and it's uh, very successful. Mm -hmm. Also, we can preserve it like a, a spore, a spore, yeah, like a spore, I, I don't know, uh, basmi, I don't know what it's mean in, in English. Spore print. Yeah, spore brand exactly. Yeah, yeah uh, I, I hope we we collaborate together in, in environmental equality authority because I'm working in environmental equality authority and you about a new a new a new research we can do it together and I can share more information about my sample. Yeah, if you write your email down, yeah, it's my pleasure to. Uh, yeah, I will. Uh, I will put my email in the chat, and you can email me directly. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah.
how do I access? And so, if we're speaking about uh, another thing, if we're speaking about the the benefit of uh, the, the benefit of mushroom for the environment or, or the ecosystem, it's uh, it's a very important, especially for uh, for uh, for analysis or for uh, analysis of wood residue, because there is a many study uh, or experiment speaking about wood wood you remain uh, it's taken twenty years without mm -hmm. decomposing. Yeah. But if if the mushroom is growing in the the forest, it will take maybe two to three years. To decompositing the, the 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 wood or the straw or other thing, mm -hmm. and otherwise also because we have a problem in environment, the burning of of hay or uh, straw generally. The uh, many farmer after they finish the the cycle of growing, they 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 burning the the plant residue, especially for the farmer. In Jericho, they are burning the the, the leaf of a dead bulb. Mm -hmm. We're doing a small test about uh, crushing the 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 dead bulb, the, the dead bulb leaves, and growing oyster mushroom. It's also successfully because yeah. it's not it's contain a high uh, amount of. Uh, cellulose, uh, as we know, that the cellulose is the, the the first food for, in a simple way, the first food for for mushroom. In other way, because there are, as you mentioned, because there is uh, like agaricus mushroom or other family, it's need the, the ready food like compost. Yeah. The compost contain animal manure and plant manure, but mm -hmm. like uh, family of oyster oyster mushroom, it's it can decompose the, the straw, uh, mm -hmm. sawdust, other things. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, oysters are, are, are capable of, of digesting quite a lot, and they don't they don't need it to be in, in nearly as a digestive state. So that's really great to hear that, that farmers in Jericho are, are able to, to use mushrooms rather than burning. That's a, a much better way of dealing with that waste, for sure. Okay. Um, ah, Mazen wants to talk. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming to this little presentation. Uh, so I've put my email in the chat. So if you want to contact me, um, please send me an email. I would love to go mushroom hunting with you. That would be really great. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the, uh, a few uh, months ago on these same series of talks, we um, we had somebody speak to us about soil uh, biodiversity and the importance of soil biodiversity. Uh, this is related to agriculture and and really um, you know the the soil uh, fungi are really very important for this component as are other things in the soil and I think we need to have more talks related to agriculture and agrobiodiversity and uh, and soil richness and how we can measure these things and how we can evaluate uh, material like, uh, you know, soil samples for organic content and things like that. Uh, this is one point I want to say so that if you know anybody who can enrich us in this area, uh, that would be great. يعني إذا في حدا بقدر يساعدنا بهاي المواضيع نتعلم عنها مع بعض. الموضوع الثاني, the second part I want to say is this is precisely why we do these things uh, Thursday functions uh, to develop potential new collaborations, potential new projects with each other. Uh, so that, again, the idea is to improve our uh, collective knowledge and to publish papers related to Palestine in scientific literature, which is uh, very, very important. As you know, um, we have an attack on everything Palestinian, including nature. Uh, so... Uh, we will arrange other talks. Uh, next week, we already have a speaker, uh, Muhammad Najajra, 
uh, will speak about the paper that uh, is related to developing our own here uh, urban eco garden. Uh, this is a paper that was uh, accepted and uh, will appear in a couple of weeks, but uh, we have a lot of lessons uh, to learn from the uh, trials and errors in our own garden of how to create a botanic garden that's rich, that has, uh, I don't know, several species of mushrooms were from the garden. Uh, there are other things that are here that we have studied, and uh, Muhammad Najajra will uh, brief you on this next week. Uh, the week after, we may skip it. Uh, we have an engagement and then we will go back after that. But anyway, we will send you this information by email. And I still hope that you, each of you will think of uh, a subject that they are interested in. Uh, you know, one, one of the areas, Dr. Walid, you are interested in not just in... Uh, mushrooms and things, you're interested in everything, but uh, but one time you gave a talk about orchids. Uh, you know, we had uh, published a paper on orchids, but now we have DNA analysis of orchids. And I will see if well, from the group who did her master's degree on uh, phylogenetic relationships of orchids, she can give us some idea. We have a meeting actually today with uh, with the her supervisor from uh, London, uh, Dr. Alfred Vogler, who uh, did uh, much, uh, you know, their laboratory did the sequencing and uh, alignments for us. So if, uh, if uh, I can convince her to give us about the orchid DNA next after, after uh, Muhammad Najajra, mm -hmm. that would be good. Uh, but we're still looking for people. And the reason we do, again, you know, the reason we do these things is, uh, I mean, I've learned about mushrooms quite a bit by listening to T Dr. Teresa, but uh, uh, is is to, to improve our knowledge like this, but also to think about potential uh, development of our collective work in Palestine. So... Uh, so again, think of subjects, write to us, and we will put you on the calendar for events. Allah yarham shuhada'na, wa yishfi jarhana, wa yqim anna halghul, hada li alayna. Iza hada andu shay, bihab dhifu, tfadl. Wa illa sanughlik. We are one minute away. <laughs> we are on time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Shukran, Jamaa al Hudur. I know that there are people who say, "Oh, but they set up this." So why am I here? I'm thinking seriously about putting the announcements for the people who don't come. I don't know what you think about this point. دكتور خليك دكتور يعطيك العافيه خليك ماشي على ما انت ماشي انشر عادي خلي الناس تشوف اوكي خليهم يشوفوا نو نو دكتور مازن اي ثينك اف يو جاست ببلش ا سامري اوف ذا انترو اوف ذا برزنتيشنز اند تو انكرج بيبل تو كم بيكوز اي ثينك ذا ديسكشن ان ذا ان سايد ذا ذا ليكتشر اور ذا برزنتيشن از ماتش ماتش مور benefit for the research in future research i think if you just like make, like make a, like one two three minutes or five minutes summarizing from the for the to encourage people to come again summarize uh, in writing yeah. or on the video no no, no video video it just as you know just main points from the videos it will be easy at the end or in the beginning <laughs> <laughs> why, why you, why, why you want to be, prevent this knowledge for the whole uh, world? Why? So, uh, to to encourage way? people, you know, no, to encourage people, and the one who ask for, we can, you can send it, but not just to, the people, not just to, okay. not to care okay. about. It's good to be here to discuss, to get more knowledge, and to enrich the meeting, because oh, really we need not just to take. 
instead of sharing the whole recording, share a couple of slides and a couple of uh, points. That's it. Yeah. So that they are intrigued and they will come. <laughs> Editing. <laughs> yeah. Well, Thank I, you know, for I think there are some people who don't want to attend for uh, political or other reasons. <laughs> <laughs> and no matter what we do, it doesn't seem to help. Mm -hmm. I hope so. We'll try everything. We want everybody to attend. We want all the NGOs to come and attend. We, we are trying to strengthen them. We're trying to make them better. And if they all come, they will all benefit. All right, شكراً كثير أعطيكم العافية. يلا يا سادة يعطيهم العافية شكراً كثير على اليوم. باي. يعطيكم العافية سلامات.